Hello everyone, this is a video, that's a video response to somebody else's video. So, Sean D. Stanfast, uh, who's becoming a friend, which is really awesome, uh, he just did a video, he just put it up called, um, So You Want to Collect? And there's been a few other people, a bunch of people, putting up a video about the question of, can you have too many books? And just because it kind of links into that, I thought it'd be nice to do a video on my two cents on collecting, what it means, why I think it's not necessarily materialistic, and um, just talking about that for a bit, and talking a little bit about my collections, and um, yeah, it's the same something in about hoarding as well. Um, I am a hoarder, but um, that's a different thing I think to collecting, and I'll clarify that later on. So, um, is it materialistic? What is collecting? Um, the thing is, I think the thing about collecting, which I'm going to say a number of times in this video probably, is that, well, it's the two things, but the first thing I'm probably going to say a lot, which is the fact that it's all about the hunt. It's all about looking, searching, keeping your radar up for books, if it's a book collecting thing. Um, but whatever it is you're collecting, you've got your radar up and it's such a great feeling when you do find an additional part of that collection. So whatever it might be, that feeling is just really lovely and it's about the hunt. It's not necessarily um, specific things. So we, we, we've all got different things we collect. Uh, I mean, my wife um, always says I've got too much stuff, but she does collect um, Charlie Bears. She's got loads of Charlie Bears and principally lots of prints related stuff. So prints, fridge magnets, um, key rings, books, obviously records, posters, canvases, um, just all sorts of things, T-shirts, all sorts of things. Um, but it's something that she, when she discovers something that's new that she hasn't seen before or something that she really likes the image of, you know, like, for example, the cover of Rainbow Children. If we ever look at that, the cover of Rainbow Children is fantastic. Uh, so anything that's got that cover on it, it's clearly um, quite a nice design and quite a nice thing to have for part of that collection. So it's not necessarily a book thing. Whatever you collect... Uh, when you find something new or you discover something new or you um, find out about something and you want to look for it or you want to keep your radar up for it, that's very special. Um, so the hunt is part of the thing, part of the attraction of collecting. So I don't think um, that necessarily is a materialistic thing because it's it's a um, it's the pleasure in finding something. So that's not the same as just amounting stuff and just keeping stuff. That's not just random stuff. Um, so... I do think that's quite an important distinction. But also, it's all about the sentimental value. So, um, you know, going back to that sort of Prince connection that my wife's got, I mean, she co-authored a really good book on Prince, um, which is this book, actually. It's from um, Exclusive Distributors. It's available online. It's a really good book. Um, and she co-authored that. Um, but um, that was through her expertise and her experience and her contacts in the Prince community. Um, but there's a lot of sentimental value that she has um, for the guy. So um, that's where the collecting thing um, nips into that sentimental thing. And for me, um, the things I collect, which I'll talk about in a minute, they have that sentimental value. They're, I think all of the things I'm going to mention are things I've been collecting pretty much all of my life, certainly all of my adult life, so up to starting from when I was about 13 or 14. So there's a lot of sentimental value to that, and I think that's worth acknowledging and celebrating because, you know, that's nice. It's not a, it's not a bad thing. So I think that those two things are why collecting is not just materialistic. It's not about just amounting stuff just you know like um obtaining things for the sake of the thing and then just suddenly realizing that you've hoarded a, um, a, an incalculable amount of stuff you didn't need to have you know that that's that's i think materialism is about you know like you know that kind of like the stereotype of someone that's insanely rich and just wants a gold lion in their front lawn just because it's a gold lion i mean i've just made that up but that kind of thing, that's material to me, that's materialistic because it's just for the sake of the fact that you've got the money and it's showing off, you know. 
And a lot of people who collect don't have a lot of money necessarily. So, um, you know, the things I, that I add to my collection, I tend to add them because I found them cheap. You know, one of my collections is, that I, is probably the thing I'm most committed to. I know there are lots of things I could add to that collection now that I can't afford. So, um, it, you know, it's not... I, that's why I do think it's different. Collecting is different to being materialistic because, I th you know, for me, as I say, mat being materialistic is about buying for the sake of buying and, you know, having a silver unicorn on the roof of your house because it's a silver unicorn and you could afford it and it's like 15 feet high designed by some famous designer so uh so yeah i do think it's different so um i just wanted to mention a couple of things one of the most recent um crazes in collecting over the last sort of i don't know 10 years don't know how long it's been going it's the funko pop figures and i have my yin and yang of um, writing, you've got the um, the optimistic, joyful Jim Henson, and you've got the more cynical, dark mind of Stephen King. Um, it's like the angel and the devil there. Uh, those are the only two Funko, Funko Pop things I've got, and I'm not, I don't collect them. I like those two, and I like having them by my computer, but I don't collect them. Like some people just have hundreds of them, and they like keeping them in there packaging because they think they would be worth more and I don't really relate to the idea of keeping them in the packaging so you can sell them later because that's a little bit more like just having something that's an investment because you think you're going to make money off it later which is fine but it's a different definition of collecting for me I don't think that's necessarily something I can relate to personally but the Funko Pop thing is a big craze you can see them everywhere and it's definitely taken off and it's still going they're still releasing new ones and it's all, it's just quite fascinating. I've got used to the image now. I didn't used to like the style. Um, and clearly having two myself, clearly have got used to the style, but I didn't quite, it didn't quite gel with me straight away. So, and the Funko Pop thing is a big thing. Um, but also, um, if I just move this way, um, when I was younger, um, my first experience of collecting would have been um, the the comics, I guess, I bought. But, Probably more important than that, the thing that I probably was more, most excited about was those sticker albums. Uh, did you get sticker albums when you were a kid? So I, I definitely did. I loved them. I got the E.T. one. I had football sticker albums. I was into football when I was a kid. And, um, oh, what else? The Star Wars ones. Uh, Star Wars trading cards as well. That was a big thing. So that's a collector thing. So, you know, you get that bug when you're younger, I guess. Um, but those Star Wars cards, trading cards, were so cool. So I don't know if you can remember those. Um, and I guess, I i mean, I had loads of Star Wars-related stuff, so Star Wars figures and stuff like that. Um, I had tons and tons of Star Wars-related things when I was a kid. But definitely the um, the trading cards was, you know, you could argue that's collecting for the sake of it, um, but that was quite exciting at the time when I was younger because you'd, you know, you'd buy a packet and you didn't know what's in the packet. And then if there was stuff you didn't have, you'd be like, yeah. And then you'd say to your mates, have you got this one? Because I've got two of these. And like, uh -huh. um, So the sticker albums and the trading cards from Star Wars are really cool. Um, and obviously, um, there's people who do collect ornaments and d decorations for their home. And uh, I know that um, I've had family members that have had certain collections based around the fact they loved those designs. So I know um, the... There's a design of some animals that people like, and they sort of buy ornaments for that. And uh, and then my my nan-in-law, she liked a Beatrix Potter stuff, and she's also collected teapots. Um, so you know that that's another thing where they find something that they really like that particular style, which is quite nice. So um, you know that's a different kind of collecting, but I do think it's a similar sort of thing. That excitement about seeing something in the wild um, that you haven't got that's part of that that they can add to that collection that's very special, and you build up this sentimental value to it, which I think is really nice. So um, I just wanted to mention a few book-related things. So um, one of the things that I think is quite cool, and it sort of puts your radar up, even if there might they might be authors or books you're not aware of, and that's the SF Masterwork series. If you're a science fiction fan, you're probably aware of this series, and I think the design is really cool, and... Uh, 
you know, they're quite a nice collection to build up and they look really good on the spines. You know, I've got a number of them. I've got, I don't know, probably over a dozen, I guess. Um, and I don't buy them. There are some I've, some of these SF Masterworks I've just bought from the library, so I don't collect them for the sake of collecting them. But I do like it when I've got those versions of them. Um, I've got a bunch of Ursula K. Le Guin ones, but, um, and some Philip K. Dick and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, the SF Masterworks series is really cool. Uh, so sometimes certain editions of books are quite nice to see on a shelf because it just looks really cool. Um, so that's that might be something that is part of that collecting thing. And also specific authors. So there are three authors for me that historically have meant a lot since being really young that I've been so excited if I found something new that I didn't have. And it's obviously got harder and harder as time goes on. So... Uh, Robert Sheckley I've mentioned before. Uh, this is just a selection of Robert Sheckley things. Um, uh, Mind Swap, I've got loads of versions of this, and it's one of my favourite books. Used to, When I was younger, when I was like a teenager, I used to say it was my favourite book. Um, I absolutely love it, and I've got loads of versions, but then um, the Robert Look Like Me is really cool, short, short stories. Um, Charge of Space, I've seen loads of versions of that. I've, I've got two versions, I think. Um, Pilgrimage to Earth... Um, I mean, I've got, I've got, besides these books I'm showing you now, I've got a whole box full of Robert Sheckley stuff. Same to you, Doubled. Um, I love that cover. <laughs> it looks really cheap and funny and weird, but I love it. And this is actually one of my favourite collections of his anyway. Um, and then there's a sort of more recent collection of his um, celebrated short stories here, um, which is real awesome. So whenever I find any Robert Sheckley things I haven't got, I'm always shocked because I've got so much, but also it's really nice to see it. So that's really cool. And Richard Matheson, I've mentioned before, there's a few Richard Matheson books here. So Shrinking Man and I Am Legend are obviously two famous ones, but I've got tons and like the Third from the Sun is a collection here. Um, and um, there's Shores of Space there as well, which I was going to mention in a different way. So Richard Matheson is another one of those. And someone I'm sort of trying to build up a, um, a video for, uh, Harlan Ellison. Um, there's tons of Harlan Ellison books I've got. Um, so there's like Shatter Day, which I think Michael K. Vaughan mentioned a little while back. Um, All the Sounds of Fear, which I've talked about before on the channel. Um, uh, it's an amazing collection. That was the first book I ever bought by him as well. So that means a lot to me from that point of view. Time of the Eye, which is really cool. I'm rereading re -reading that at the moment. It's really cool. Um, and uh, The Beast of Shadow Love at the Heart of the World. Um, again, I use that book, this copy of this book, to talk about a boy and his dog. And Dangerous Visions 2, I've got Dangerous Visions 1, and again, Dangerous Visions somewhere as well. I've got a whole book, again, and a whole box of Ellison stuff. When I finally got the glass tea, which was probably about 20, 25 years ago or something, I was so pleased to have it. This is his rants about television. Um, so that was really nice to get that. And then this is one of my most recent purchases, which is a really big, thick tome about Elby. It's got his editorial articles in it and essays. Again, his rants. Um, but uh, anything by Ellison I like to find, anything I haven't got. And there are still a few things I haven't got, so if I ever find them, it's really cool. And one of the recent things I found, another really cute little book, and this is a double book. So this is um, The Man with Nine Lives by Han Ellison, and it's a... Uh, Double with uh, Touch of Infinity by Helen Ellison. So that's really cool. Double, um, really sort of little um, vintage paperback. So that's really nice to find. 35 cents. Um, these Ace recording, uh, these, these Ace um, books and these Corgi books. Amazing. Uh, that's just really cool. So that was really good to find. Um, very delicate condition, this. But again, rare Helen Ellison, which is awesome to find. So um, that's a really big thing for me, those particular three. But then there's a few other authors that if I find something, I'm like, oh, my God. And uh, But those three in particular, I will buy doubles um, in case I lose something. I mean, I couldn't find my copy of um, The Same To You Doubled by Rob Sheckley. Um, but then I bought another one because I found it and I thought, well, I can't find my other, other copy. So I don't like having gaps for those three authors in particular. But there's a few others as well. And uh, the thing is, I've also discovered... These little vintage paperbacks, so if I just compare it to a normal book, so this sort of size, these are much smaller. 
Can you see that? Can you actually see that? Is it? Does it? Can you? See? I don't know if it translates well on the video. But these are really, just really nice. And uh, these are old. These are only going to be found in the world, and or maybe eBay. But they're great finds, and and they have covered some of the authors I really like. So this is Shores of Space that I showed earlier, but this is also um, City of Illusions by Ursula K. Le Guin. So that was a nice find because I didn't have that book or know about that book when I bought it. And uh, the Illustrated Man, and I've said before about how much I love Ray Bradbury, and that's quite an awesome cover there. And then this is a short story collection that I also found in these. Um, they're Corgi um, books. And I love, I just love the design. And if I find anything like this, especially if it's stuff by authors I love anyway, I'm definitely going to snap that up. So, you know, it's quite possible I might buy doubles if they're this sort of thing. And I think they won't necessarily um, fill up my shelves quickly because they're quite small, but I just think they're awesome. So that's another example, like the SF Masterwork series, where it's a particular edition that makes me want to have it. So that is a factor in this as well. So you could, there is an element of materialism there, isn't there? But so talking um, about some of my things that I actually collect, some of the collections that I've developed over the years. So the big one, the one that I get really excited if there's an opportunity to get to add to it um, without spending like 60 quid on one item. And that is my collection of Twilight Zone magazines. So here is a little thumbnail from the video I did on my Twilight Zone magazine collection. And uh, I uh, really treasure it. They're always kept um, in a safe place. And literally every few years there's, you know, some additions to it. And it's just built up over, over time. And I've got loads. There's only a few left I need to get. But it's not complete yet, so it's still there's still some sort of holy grail elements to it. But um, they're very rare, and as I try and say in the video about them, they do cover, they tick a lot of boxes in some of the things that I love about fiction. So, um, and Twilight Zone means a lot to me. So I don't feel like it's too weird, but yeah, that definitely is a hunt thing. Um, cartoonists. I collect cartoonist books. I've got over 120 or so. And I am, I don't just randomly buy them. So I, I've never bought a Giles book and I'm always finding Giles books in secondhand shops. But I haven't got to the point yet where I bought one of those. And even with Peanuts books, um, I've, I've, I've not bought something before and I've found them because they're, they're, they're quite common. So, uh, but I do like the Peanuts strips. So I have got a few. Um, but, I, I don't know, I get more excited when I find something I haven't seen before or cartoons I haven't seen before or additions to my favourite cartoonist. There's a video I did on my favourite cartoonist, which I can just put a little picture of there um, and I'll link it below. Uh, so uh, that's another thing. And um, the books on animation. So I haven't got tons and tons. Um, I mean, obviously, like over 100. I haven't got anything like that. There's not that many books on animation, but I have got quite a nice collection, uh, which I showed you some of that in a book, in a video, sorry, of animation books. And my Marx Brothers books as well. Um, I've got a couple of boxes full of Marx Brothers books as well. So I do collect those, but they're quite rare to find. So, again, it's back on that hunt thing. And I think the sentimentality is partly because I've had those moments over a period of decades where I've been pleased to see something and it's just sort of add, been added to the collection. And that I think that creates that sentimentality I think so those are some of the things I've collected and you know in addition to the, my favorite authors and some books that I that mean a lot to me in general sometimes what a one-off book that means a lot to me just looks like one author um, that I haven't collected the author's work but the, a particular book so that you know so I do collect books in general um, but it does bring me to the question of hoarding so the thing with, I am a hoarder, so I've got um, carry bags full of bits of paper that bring me back to something that happened um, when I was younger or something, some memory from the early part of my marriage or um, so we've, we've kept, we've kept loads of stuff from when the kids were little, um, 
you know, there are stuff I don't need to have that I've got in the loft mostly. Um, and that's definitely a hoarding thing. I don't need that stuff. But, you know, I, I, try, and, I, I, I try and have a balance. I mean, I've got my old school books. <laughs> Why do I have my old school books? Um, and if you think about my history books, I bought a lot of history books when I did my degree. I don't really need the books anymore for academic purposes, but I've forgotten a lot of the content, so I do have an interest. So I will read some of those again, and I have thinned it down a lot, and I've got rid of loads and loads of books recently, but then that was after another period, a few months before that, where I got rid of loads of books. So I'm always trying to keep a balance of books I want to keep and books I don't need to have anymore. But it's a difficult balance, and I do change my mind, and I've regretted some things I've got rid of, and there are still some things I could get rid of. So it's a balance that's never really reconciled. So I don't know if you can relate to that, but I do think that getting the balance right with collecting and then not hoarding is a difficult one, I think. Um, but that balance is one of the things that's connected to um, finding stuff and getting excited about stuff. And then you think, OK, I need to thin this stuff out a little bit. So, I mean, one of the things I was going to mention, um, which is, again, I don't need to have it, but it sort of niggles because I've seen it a few times. And I do want it. I used to have it when I was a kid. And I think it's because I've got this sort of sentimental memory of it. And that is the Marvel Comics novelization of, or kind of comic novelization of The Empire Strikes Back. So I used to have that when I was little. I absolutely loved it. I've kept it for ages, but then it got really knackered. So I ended up getting rid of it because it was just in three pieces. But I'd love to have it again. But. I don't need to, why? But I don't know, there's something about it um, that I don't have that sentimental value to it. Um, so, so yeah, getting that balance right is a big part of, of trying not to um, make it cross into just hoarding, which is obviously something to think about if you know you can be a bit of a hoarder with random stuff that's just, you know, ticket stubs or programmes to theatre shows you've seen or... Or um, I've got I've got loads of stuff that connected to my band, so um, you know, sort of uh, gig posters and uh, just mementos of some of the gigs we've done. Um, I don't keep set lists. Um, my drummers keep set lists, uh, which is kind of which is really cool. I love that, but I don't do that. But there are some other things. I've got bags of stuff that goes goes right back to uh, my early days of songwriting as well. So. I do hoard, but I try not to hoard books because clearly they, they take up a lot of space. But you could argue if I've got a lot of books, does that mean I'm hoarding books? I don't know. Um, but that balance, it's all about that balance. But I just wanted to end on a positive note because obviously that balance, getting the balance right is not simply positive. There's a positive and negative side to it. So just ending on a positive. Uh, two recent finds that I found in the wild um, before I started my 30 book challenge which I'm about to finish which is a real relief so I can start finding stuff again um, but two things that are really cool so I've mentioned Robert Sheckley and I didn't know about this book and I found this a little while back and this is his parody of spy thrillers The Game of X has anyone heard of this or read it um, if you're a Robert Sheckley fan you can probably imagine what kind of style it is and I can't wait to read it but again, I didn't expect to find a Robert Sheckley book I hadn't heard of. I mean, there are some a few books I know I haven't got, a few. Like, I, I didn't buy his um, Babylon 5 book, Call to Arms. Um, I almost buy, bought it a few times because obviously I collect his stuff. But I made a decision ages ago not to buy those kind of uh, sort of tie-in books, but I'm starting to buy them for Garb August. Um, so I might buy a call to arms anyway. But anyway, uh, Robert Sheckley, it was really cool to find this spy thriller parody, The Game of X. And then also, um, another example of some of these great finds you get. Um, this is a book by H. Beam Piper. And uh, he's on my radar because of Little Fuzzy. And Little Fuzzy is the original version of the book Fuzzy Nation by John Scalzi. And I really like the book Fuzzy Nation by John Scalzi, but that's a, a, literally a remake of a H. Beam Piper book called Little Fuzzy, which was really 
celebrated at the time. And just it fascinates me that, he, that John Scalzi wrote a remake book, so literally reinterpreted the story. Uh, and this is the first time I've seen another book by H. Bean Piper. And I read the back of it and it looked really good. So I'm going to read that and maybe review it um, once I've read it. But again, like a really interesting find. And these kind of things are just really exciting when you find them, I think. It's one of the nice things about book hunting um, because it's not necessarily finding a lavish edition of something or a book you've known about for years, but it's finding the ones you don't know. It's like when you go to festivals and you discover a band you've never heard of. You know, music festivals are about the stuff you don't know about before you go, not about the headliners. And book hunting is about finding these rare, unusual books you didn't know about rather than a nice version of a book you already knew about. So surprise is all about that book hunting thing. So, yeah, um, collecting is fun. It can be um, too much. So I do think you've got to get that balance right. But I think it's a positive thing. We all do it because even the people that um, don't necessarily relate to collecting books or CDs or videos or whatever, they still would might collect shoes or ornaments or... Um, you know stamps or whatever um a lot of people collect so i think it's it's quite a common thing and it's all about getting that balance right i'm going to try something now which i've never tried before i'm going to try and um, end the video rather than end on my theme song which is from the Beamer's last album i'm going to try and do a little link so i'm going to um just uh put a little link here of the twilight zone magazine video and hopefully you can see that and uh, check it out because it's quite interesting. <laughs> thanks a lot for watching and thanks so much for the new subscribers. Really, really appreciate it. Let me know what you think about what I've said about collecting. Thanks a lot.